Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, this is going to be a bill signing full of emotion. There's elation, happiness. There's also deep reflection and sadness and emotion that is almost too deep to express. Um, but it is a good day. In the State of the State speech I gave a little over a month ago, I said, if anyone in America doubts that we are going to do everything to protect our children, I said, watch us. And this group here has been watching and trying to protect our children and our families and our communities um, for decades, quite literally decades. The issues that we will sign today are two very simple common sense issues that have been being asked to be debated here at the Capitol for decades. And even that small request was not honored until this year. And the leadership you're going to hear from in the House and the Senate around the whole spectrum of public safety, a transformational bill to make our communities safer, to bring restorative justice into the forefront, and to have the most basic protections around firearms that we can put into place in the state is going to happen. Um, this is an issue some of you have heard me talk about for a long time. I grew up around firearms. I have hunted my entire life. I own them to this day. I uh, used them in the military, and uh, when asked, I will tell people I was the top gun of the congressional trap shoot three years in a row. Um, I know how to use these things. I understand our rights as Americans to do these things, but I refuse to allow extremists to define what responsible gun ownership looks like and to make this about the Second Amendment. This is not about the Second Amendment. This is about the safety of our children and our communities. That's what's happening here today. Every time a tragedy happens, and you'll hear from the experts up here who will be able to tell you this, it has become nonchalant now that the 6 o'clock news reports on it and a mass shooting doesn't even make it to the 10 o'clock news hour. <laughs> Families destroyed, sadness in communities that will last generations, and the usual trope of thoughts and prayers, and we really you know, need, to, need to do something about that. By a few of these people, I'd be worried. Their prayers are not being answered. They're not being heard, apparently. And all of us coming together here have said, we need far more than that. We need action. And in Minnesota, that action is going to happen today with the signing of these bills. The leaders that are here, from Speaker Hortman, um, Majority Leader Dietzig, Senator Latz, Representative Pinos and Frazier, and the countless others who are standing up here um, have spent thousands of hours, quite literally, crafting smart legislation around this. But you're also going to hear from Melissa, who went to work, expected like everyone else to have a day, do their work and go home, and witnessed a tragedy of death and destruction around her from an active shooter. And then I would also say for us, I feel blessed. I feel like the universe does answer prayers um, because my friend, my classmate, my colleague, our champion and hero, Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, is here with us today. Someone who has experienced this firsthand on that fateful day as her young constituent came to see her congressman was gunned down in a parking lot on a Saturday morning on a beautiful Arizona day. Um, she has taken that tragedy come back stronger than ever, told us in Minnesota this needed to get done, helped lead our way here, and she's here today to witness that happening. So, um, Congresswoman, you are a true champion for so many. You are a role model for all of us, and it is fitting that you will be the last person to speak today as we sign this into law, and we are grateful. So, We talked often as uh, members of a team on an administration, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and I, but we talked more often as I sat in the audience the other night and watched her daughter perform Jungle Book, um, <laughs> as she congratulated my daughter Hope, who is here somewhere, and talks about my son Gus. Um, we talk about, as parents, the things that we want to see for our children. We talk about the things that keep us up at night about our children, and I think it's really fitting when you have a dad and a mom and along with the first lady as we all gather together um, 
I'm just grateful to Minnesotans. I'm grateful to this group that's here, that we're showing and sending a message to our children. Things can be different. Things can be different. And I encourage all of you, get a chance with some young people around. Get a chance if you're in a school or whatever. And just mention something about doing smart things about gun control. You will quickly find yourself the most popular person in the room. You will see pure joy erupt out of those children because the trauma they're experiencing just in the damn active shooter drills, not to mention witnessing shootings, and there's very few of our families have not been touched by this, um, just see how happy they're going to be today. So it keeps with our theme, making Minnesota the best state in the country for children and families to grow up. With that, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan. Thank you. Um, I'm Siobhan's mom, and that's the most important role, as the governor said, that I have today and every day. Like so many of the historic victories this year, the work that went into this bill did not begin simply in January. It began decades ago. It has taken decades of organizing and rallies and marches and meetings, years of hope and years of heartbreak to get us here today. Thank you for never losing faith. Public safety is just that, safety for everyone. Because everyone deserves to be safe and valued and protected in their schools, in their homes, at the grocery store, in the movies, and throughout their communities. That is our role as lawmakers, that is our role as parents, and that is our role as grown-ups. These laws will help prevent gun violence before it occurs and we will save lives. It's as simple as that. I am proud to be here with the incredibly courageous people who have taken their deepest pains and turned that into progress. It is no small thing to share your grief and your trauma over and over. Congresswoman, we are so grateful for your leadership I am so honored that you are here with all of us today. The people of Minnesota owe you a debt of gratitude. And to LaTanya, thank you for showing me what it means to be a good mom. And you honor your daughter every day, and we are honored to know you. Today we are moving into a world that is safer for our children because of all of you, because of parents, because of moms. Yeah. And one mom who sounded the alarm and asked for accountability is our First Lady Gwen Walls. And I am grateful for your leadership, First Lady. So thank you so much to everyone who helped us get here. The memories of those that we have lost will not be in vain. When the governor signs this bill today, that is the work. That is how we honor the memories of those that we have lost. And that is how we commit to not one more. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, my state senator, yeah. Ron Lance. Yeah. Um, after every mass shooting, <clears throat> the airwaves are filled with thoughts and prayers. And with the follow-up phrase, which is, it's too emotional, too hard right now, now's not the time to talk about legislative solutions. And those of us who are involved in the legislature going, when is the right time? Right. Is there ever a right time, if not in the immediate aftermath of a tragedy, that identifies for all of us the need for those legislative solutions? 
Well, here, right now, the time is now. Yeah. Yeah. And those of us who are here as legislators and policymakers know that we are only the vehicles. And those of us who have carried the ball across the finish line today know that we are only the latest in a long line, in some cases a tragically long line, of people that have been working on this issue for decades. Uh, I want to give a uh, note of gratitude to then Representative Howard Ornstein. Yeah. Who Probably most of the people in this room don't even know or recall him. He's, of course, still around. Uh, but he was one of the earliest people to bring efforts um, to, to fight gun violence in the state legislature. And we stand on the shoulders of all of them. Uh, so, you know, Representative Pinto, Representative Frazier, uh, and those of us who were chief authoring the bills, and, of course, surrounded by our other colleagues who were so integral in the, in the work this year, um, know how important this is, not only as a legislative team, but for all the advocates who are here, because, and those who lost loved ones, <clears throat> who never dropped the ball, continue to fight for this. When I was a college student, I took a semester in Washington, D.C. at American University, and I first saw the posters from Handguns Incorporated, Handgun Control Incorporated, thank you, that had the list of, of the countries and the number of gun deaths. Um, and, you know, America was way, way multiples above all the other uh, industrial countries, major countries of the world, because we were awash in guns then. Um, and you can go through the, the interim organizations, you know, the Brady campaign um, in, in the wake of, uh, of that shooting, um, all the way up, you know, to Moms to Man. And, the wonderful work of Gabby Giffords. Thank you for your continued work and presence here in Minnesota. You've been here multiple times now mm -hmm. on this effort. Um, we're all working toward not having to look at the Capitol or Perkins or other institutions where the flag is flying at half mast That's because right. of a mass shooting. That's exactly right. Some days it thinks it's always at half mast. Yep. You know, I'd like to see a break uh, from that. Uh, you know, I've been working on this since I was first elected to the House in 2002. So, but for me, it's been a policy issue. For a lot of people, it's a lot more than that. So I'm very pleased to be able to work with my colleagues who are here. Uh, the First Lady, who's been a champion on this issue for many, many years. We stood it together at a number of rallies in the rotunda, <laughs> beseeching those who had the majorities or those who had the votes to give us a hearing to help us to make progress on this. Um, elections matter. Elections matter and thoughtful legislators who are willing to work through tough issues and sometimes make tough votes. Because in the end, that's what it takes uh, to get the votes up on the board. But in the real end, this is going to save a lot of lives. Across the state, suicides and homicides. And it's going to save a lot of families from trauma, and it's going to save a lot of injuries that don't end up being fatal to. So I'm just very pleased to be the latest in the long line of, of people that have worked on this and to be able to help carry this ball across the, the final steps today. Thank you. I want to introduce, uh, uh, I would like now to introduce my, my friend and colleague who's worked so hard on this uh, together with me, Representative Dave Pinto. So, um, Dave Pinto from St. Paul. Um, this has been uh, this has been a six-year journey for me. Um, I introduced uh, both of these bills in 2017, 
uh, and uh, and then through the years uh, handed off the red flag uh, law uh, bill to Representative Kelly, Representative Ruth Richardson, and then Kelly Moeller. Um, yeah, Senator Frazier, yes. And a special shout out to Chair Moeller. Chair Moeller, who really, um, who is the person who led the charge in this, in this final uh, conference committee with Senator Latz um, to, to advance this as well. Um, and, you know, we had, uh, we fought to get hearings. We're in the minority in 2018. Uh, that got blocked. We then passed these bills in the House in 2019 and 2020. That got blocked. And we kept on pushing and pushing. And um, it was easy, I think, for all of us to think that uh, it just couldn't happen. Um, and although I've been on this journey, um, I've been joined along the way at, at countless marches and, and rallies by people who've been on a much longer and much harder journey, um, people who've lost family members to gun violence. And I just want to express um, how grateful I am to you for, um, for bringing us to this day. Um, we can think about the statistics and think about the many lives lost and, um, and how much our country is an outlier um, and the people have lost their lives, but so many of us I know are thinking about a person, right? They have their person in mind today. Their person is no longer with us. And um, each of you took the pain and anguish of that experience, and um, I know there were a lot of thoughts and prayers that you all had as well in addition to the rest of us, right? Um, and converted um, that pain and anguish into energy to say that nobody else should go through what you went through. Nobody else should go through what your loved one went through. Um, I know that when the governor signs um, these laws, uh, these bills, that, that your person is going to be in your mind and know how grateful I personally am and how grateful the people of Minnesota are for you taking that step um, because we would not be here without those people saying, um, um, now's the time. And I'm not going to allow this to happen to anybody else. And please just know how personally grateful I am to you um, for that um, and what a difference this is going to make. Thank you. And, actually, and I've been joined um, this past couple of years by my colleague, Representative Cedric Frazier. Introducing him now. Thanks. everybody, Cedric Frazier, uh, City of New Hope. Um, you know, I, I think I came at this from a different perspective than probably some of my colleagues. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Gun violence was prevalent in my community. It wasn't the mass shootings in our schools, but it was the gun violence in our communities, on the blocks, on the many neighborhoods I had to tra traverse as I traveled the city buses to my school. And for me, I believe you're, you're often put in moments at the right time to do the most good that you can do. And when I had the opportunity to carry this bill and, and we've heard my colleagues talk about how long we've been on this journey, and I often talk about being a, a part of a relay team. And to be a part of this league and being a part of this moment was important for me because of the lived experiences that I have. We often talk about uh, now it is becoming almost commonplace that every weekend there's a mass shooting. And we always say we don't have to live this way. But unfortunately, too many of us are living exactly this way. And each time there's gun violence, there's pain, there's grief, there's trauma, and it's relived over and over again every time we have to continue to hear about it on the news or a mom or dad gets that call from the school district that there's been an active shooter or there's been an incident. So for me, with my experience growing up on the south side of Chicago, being in this moment, I had to take the opportunity to take some action, to do something. And carrying this bill was that action to do something. So again, I want to thank Moms and Men Action, Protect Minnesota, Ruth Richardson for carrying this bill in the past, Governor Walsh for being a champion, Win Walsh for being a champion. Congresswoman Gifford for continuing to turn your tragedy into something great and moving the country to a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Latonya Black, I'm wearing the uh, on me because this is the type of gun violence that I experienced, that she experienced, 
and I want to make sure no one else has to experience it. This has been a long time coming. And I often said as we debated this bill, when our opponents would say, well, this isn't going to stop everything. And I'd say, our job is to protect people. Right. And if it stops one tragedy, or if it stops 10 tragedies, <laughs> then we've done our job. And when the governor signs this bill, we've done our job. So I'll, I'll close there, and I'll introduce Chief Jay Henthorne from the city of Richfield. Yeah. Good afternoon. It is a privilege to be here today on behalf of the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association. My name is Chief Jay Henthorne. I'm from the city of Richfield. We represent over 300 chiefs of police across the state of Minnesota and over 150 command staff members. As Representative Frazier said, when those calls come out, our officers, our sheriff's deputies, are the ones that respond, our state troopers. And unfortunately, we are the ones that have to go to the door and tell those families that their individuals, their family members, have been victims of gun violence. We have all seen a steady rise in gun violence throughout the state of Minnesota over the last several years. The Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association, along with many Minnesotas, Minnesotans, support background check legislation and, and extreme risk protection order legislation. With this bill being signed into law, it will require background checks on all sales and transfers and will prevent at least some of the firearms from going to individuals who are not legally allowed to possess them. As Senator Frazier talked about, we know that this will not prevent all gun violence. But on behalf of the State Chiefs Association, we know it will present the majority of it. And we will... And our police officers, our sheriff's deputies, our state troopers will continue to fight every day to take gun violence out of our communities. The extreme risk protection order focuses on a relatively rare yet far too often tragic circumstances where an individual's mental health issues escalate to dangerous behavior. These orders will allow law enforcement or family members to bring evidence to a judge to temporarily separate the person in crisis from firearms when there's a substantial evidence that they pose a significant danger to themselves or others by possessing a firearm. Family members in law enforcement are often the first to see these warning signs as we respond to calls for service of people in mental crisis. With this law, the issuance of temporary extreme risk protection orders is a sensible and reasonable option to address the de and de-escalate these potentially dangerous situations for our Minnesota communities throughout the state. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce Melissa. Good afternoon. I am honored to join members of the Minnesota Legislature and Governor Walls today to celebrate this transformational and historic passage of gun safety legislation. I am Melissa Kennedy, a family medicine provider deeply invested in serving my patients. It is my responsibility to create a safe and healing space for the communities I serve. Gun violence in our country is a public health crisis and I am committed to this fight. I join you today not only as a health care provider, but also as a gun violence survivor. On Tuesday, February 9th, 2021, I went to work in our small community clinic in Buffalo, Minnesota. At approximately 10.50 a.m., while I was in an exam room with my patient, in unexpected shock and terror, gunfire echoed through the halls. Gregory Ulrich walked into our front lobby, pulled out a handgun, and started shooting at my colleagues. By 11 a.m., five members of our team had been brutally gunned down, and by the end of the day, my colleague, Lindsay Overbay, was dead. These bills matter. Gregory Ulrich was well known to the Buffalo community, Buffalo Police Department, and our clinic. He was an angry patient who had threatened to kill doctors and nurses and had previously violated a restraining order Alina Health had in place a charge thrown out after he was deemed mentally incompetent to stand trial, and the charge vanished from his record. 
Even after his interactions with law enforcement, he was able to obtain a legally issued permit to purchase a gun. A gun he later used to take one life and forever change my life and the lives of so many others. February 9th, 2021 is forever etched in my memory. Since then, I have had days of grief and suffering and thankfully, days of survival and hope. We have since reopened our clinic and most of us who were there that day continue to show up unwavering in our commitment to serve our community. Thank you all for your steadfast work serving the citizens of Minnesota and tirelessly working to pass this gun safety package. I have three beautiful children that I am so grateful I get to hug and love every day. I will continue to do this work so that they never have to endure a day like I did. Minnesota, we celebrate today, and we are just getting started. You will continue to see these red shirts show up and be fierce advocates for ongoing gun reform. We will not stop until our families are safe. Thank you. And I have the incredible honor to introduce our next speaker, who has taught me a thing or two about being brave and courageous on days where it seems like I cannot. Congresswoman Gabby Gifford. Yay. Stopping gun violence takes courage. The courage to do what's right, the courage to do ideas. I've seen great courage when my life was on the line. Now is the time to come together, be responsible. Democrats, Republicans, independent. We must never stop fight. Fight, fight, fight. Be bold. Be courageous. The nation's counting on you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you all. As I get ready to sign this, there's this connection, as you heard all the speakers talk about, to the activists and the pain and the trauma and then turning it into action. Um, where our politics sometimes gets pushed off as it's theater and it doesn't mean anything, it's a means to an end. That means to an end is improvement of lives. And I was at a rally where I was talking and I said, imagine how we can change the world with some hard work here. We put people in office like Senator Latz, like Representative Frazier, Pinto, and all the folks up here, and we get a majority of folks who agree with the common sense and you give us the opportunity and the privilege to come back to this office. And I pulled out of my pocket, I said, all it will take is the stroke of a pen to change Minnesota. The stroke of a pen. Rolf Olson took that pen. <laughs> and he said, we're here to help you get that done and to hold you accountable. We, the surviving family members, we, the activists, will guard this pen until that day comes. Tanya, that pen is here. So.
We'd be glad to take any questions of the folks who are up here. Think this moment was when you were on the campaign trail with fellow yeah, Democrats? Yeah, I believed yeah. it could, and I think that moment with the pen was the one that it, it to simplify. It was. I mean, to simplify and to understand because these things seem so insurmountable. They're so tragic, and we got thwarted. And and again, the first lady uh, found herself involved in controversy. Imagine this, because she had the audacity to come to the Capitol and said, "Give us a hearing on these." Parents are asking us for that, and got herself in a. Uh, the situation where I guess first ladies are just meant to serve tea or something they thought that's not really not the way that was going to work out and uh, no and I think I think of the idea of to me I needed to make that case that way is look let's just do the work and let's get this done because there's talented folks up here and again we're seeing this on something like this it's the stunning part about this is is how incredibly popular this is amongst the public because they know. So yeah, I always believed it could and it, it, what, I, it, what kept me going and I think what I understood, I love Representative Frazier's idea of this, the relay or we're a mountain climbing team and somebody gets pushed up. There were so many people said, your job is to take the pen and sign. So we're gonna get it, we're gonna do this, we're gonna get there and for me it kept focused on that. I knew what my role was to get that election won so that we could start to do some of these types of things, so. Not done yet. What is next when it comes to gun safety? Well, I think in this bill, and I'll maybe let some of the act or the uh, the legislators come up here. I think we're focusing on this piece of the bill. I think you saw earlier there is transformational work around juvenile justice in this. I think the work we're all talking about is let's move back upstream to make sure that that person never ends up in the Buffalo hospital with a firearm in their hand. And so I think we're looking at more of the implementation of a lot of the things that are in this bill. Uh, Governor, is this the answer to the thoughts and prayers? <laughs> well, no, and I, I, I certainly, and the thing is, I don't want to disrupt. I think for many of us, we get through the day on our spiritual beliefs. We get through on the things that we believe strongly and the goodness on that. I just think there's a combination. I think many of us believe that, that our, our creator gave us the intellect and the compassion to solve some problems. You know, we've been given the tools, so it's not as if I'm dismissing that. I, one of the things I think it's that continuous push to get better, and I know we get deflecting on this that, oh, it's mental health issues. We certainly need to fund those things, but it's not as if Scotland doesn't have issues, but when they had a school shooting they simply solved the problem around guns and saw a lot of it so I don't think um, we're certainly done but I think making a more compassionate a kinder a smarter and a safer society is something we're all striving for this was a piece that was missing clearly the chiefs and the folks will tell you this they see it every day do you know governor um, can you talk about do you do you know can someone petition file one of these petitions you know within the next week or month or what, is there some standing up of some kind of bureaucracy to do is does anyone can talk about implementation a little bit Bob no here you are commissioner so I think it's time well, I think the effective date is July 1 but it's going to take some time for the organizations to put the processes in place to, uh, to train their officers how to respond, the courts to set up the process for how to uh, receive uh, the uh, petitions and process them. Um, <clears throat> there's some pretty aggressive timelines in here to ensure that there's due process around those individuals that are involved as well. Uh, so uh, even, you know, we, we can sign today um, and you could see petitions very quickly, but it's gonna take some time for everyone to put all the, the, the mechanisms together to work about whether some rural sheriffs might not carry out the extreme risk orders is the state patrol kind of the backup or how does that work if a, if a local sheriff decides they don't want to yeah and I've not heard directly from them look all law enforcement's in this together and uh, you know the difference with our sheriffs is their elected positions the we've seen it this week look our police officers are being killed at a rate that's unacceptable we have tragic death in Pope County that that individual should have never had a firearm in their hands. So I, I anticipate folks will come around this. And again, I, I think when you step back, there is not a single thing in here that precludes a lawful firearm owner from doing exactly what they're going to do. There's not a single thing that'll prohibit me. I received the, the rifle I used for deer hunting was the rifle that my wife's grandfather used in World War II and purchased when he came out. Nothing changed on that. Those will still be able to be exchanged. So this whole idea that it's our culture and it's all of this, that's just absolute nonsense. We've allowed 
irresponsible gun owners to try and take over this debate on this. Um, and I see uh, many of us in here wearing shirts that say this is what a responsible gun owner looks like. So I don't think, I can't imagine that they would be doing that because the one thing is too, I'll guarantee you, in those rural counties, the vast majority of citizens in those counties are supportive of this piece of legislation. So I, I haven't heard directly from them and I don't think that'll be the case. Sure. Um, this came up uh, during um, the debate on the Senate floor Sorry. and in real time I got a communication from a representative from the State Sheriff's Association uh, that those members, the sheriffs of Minnesota, would do their jobs, yeah. uh, that they took an oath of office um, and they would enforce the laws of the state of Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, now they will have some discretion in the process, not just following court orders about implementing uh, you know, the, the process, but also they'll have some discretion whether to seek the petition themselves. Um, but that's one reason we have two paths to the courthouse here. Family members and guardians, actually, um, as well as law enforcement, um, will have the lawful ability to file a petition, uh, even an ex parte petition, seeking a court order. Uh, so there'll be multiple pieces here. I have full confidence in our sheriffs yeah. to, to do their jobs. They'll do it. Senator Lass, what was the moment that you realized that you guys had the votes to get this through in the Senate? <laughs> oh, now you're asking for internal deliberations. The moment I was 100% confident was when the votes went up on the board. <laughs> about the journey though it was not easy for several members of your caucus to take this vote uh, you know those members do an excellent job of, of speaking for themselves but it's true it's, it was a tough journey uh, some of them come from districts that are uh, divided on this at least among those who are very vocal uh, but we also know from polling data and this goes back a long time that if you ask the residents of a district, even those in greater Minnesota, even those that proclaim their Second Amendment sanctuary places, um, if you ask the residents, a strong majority uh, support both of these bills. Uh, so once you get beyond that, you start talking about political dynamics and elective processes and so on. Uh, but uh, I'm absolutely certain that the representatives, the senators that took what might be politically or characterized as politically difficult votes, um, we're doing so in lockstep with the majority of the residents of their districts. What do Minnesotans need to see to make sure that this is locked in, say, if the political tides turn in two, four years and it doesn't go back? Moms are going to keep showing up. Yeah, I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that's with many things, but I, I, the one thing we were discussing this with some other issues is that Minnesotans really do value the democratic process, and, and once a decision is made, they believe that, and they go with it. It seems like that, that's very clear. We had discussions around marriage equality, and once that was made, that was made, and people implemented, and, and they did, and grew on it. I think the one thing on this is you're going to see this one will, will not generate the controversy of it because it will not impact legal gun owners and they'll see that very quickly but we will hear and you will start reporting on stories of families reporting their loved one is alive because they had the ability to do this and I think once that starts to gain momentum people will see that because when you when your opposition to something is the sky is falling and the next day there's going to be tragedy when it doesn't happen you really lose a lot of what you're saying and so I'm I'm relatively confident here that Minnesotans understood what this will be and and we will continue, and I, I, I just can't focus enough. We heard this on every debate we've had. Well, asking people to wear seat belts won't protect everybody in every crash. No, it won't, but it'll protect a lot of them. And I think moving this way, they'll see that happen. We have a couple minutes. If there's on or off topic, we can just do two of those right now. Is Ford's family dead in decision? <laughs> I'm just, just going to walk out. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't Is today Friday? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so there's still three days left. We got three days left, but we got a pretty full agenda. Yeah. So I'm not driving that bus, and I'm not driving the bus in, in the, the Senate. But uh, 
we spent some long nights already here. I think it's probably pretty tough to see how it fits into the schedule in the next several days. But if you didn't hear, we have paid family medical leave. <laughs> We're staying focused. Can you talk about the philosophy behind a potential increase to the gas tax? Yeah, and I'll let the folks out here look. We we have really made the focus on this of making life more affordable for Minnesotans. We're up in Duluth yesterday where we're replacing all the lead lines across the state. And there's a homeowner there, $16,000 bill that they won't have that we're going to take lead out of there and make them healthier. On all fronts, local government aid, reduction of property taxes, increasing school aid so we don't have to have bonding referendums, public safety dollars for local communities and uh, groups that are making a difference. Um, and when it comes to things like transportation, that is dedicated funding. The one-time surplus we had um, was not created because we raised taxes. It was because of the dynamics in the economy. With that being said, we have not done. I ran in 2018 on the idea that we needed to have a long-term dedicated funding stream for our transportation system. And uh, we have now opportunities to use matching dollars from the federal government, and we're trying to make the responsible decision. Look, I got a lot of people go back home and say, I'm fiscally responsible, I didn't do anything, and their, their constituents are saying, well, what about the damn roads? Fix them. How are you going to fix them? And the fact is, we're at the same rate we've been for two decades. We have more people and more folks on the road, and the cost of everything goes up naturally. And so we're making the case that we want to be as responsible as possible. I know the legislature is working on a package of things to make this as fair as we can, but you get what you pay for. And in transportation, I think we're going to make the cost of living. We're going to make paid family medical leave. We're going to have meals at schools for kids. We have all of these things happening. And we're going to take care of our roads and build out for the future. Checks, smaller checks than you had wanted. Well, we compromised on a lot of fronts that there's things out there that be, again, we're going to remove uh, Social Security tax from 80% of folks. I find it an interesting argument. I heard Republican legislative leaders to call your legislators and tell them we need a tax cut. Who, for Glenn Taylor on that? Who are you asking him to give a, a tax cut to? Because everybody else got one. And so I make the case uh, on this that we, we compromised on things. And, and I think what's being missed in this, and it's easy to do, because we put the focus on those that have the least voice. That is the folks that are socioeconomically at a bigger disadvantage in those communities, especially with children. We are going to have not just the nation leading, but a global leading child tax credit that will reduce childhood poverty by 30% and in the long run make a difference for all of us. So uh, again, I asked for a little more. We compromised. We came together with some good packages on this. Family of four can get $1,300 back in this. And I, I remind people that every, uh, every $50 the check goes up is $200 million. Um, in Minnesota, so those are part of the decisions that was made. And if you believe that $200 million into violence prevention programs is a smart investment, we're all getting that back. So, thanks everybody.